There are still an awful lot of totally unexplored places in this marvelous island. Places that I've never even heard of, let alone, uh, let alone explored, in fact. And uh, I hope to go to many of them in, before I die. And I'd love to go to many of them several times. Uh, but just lately, I've been very interested in, um, as a painter, in, in painting ruined churches. And one of the best places I know for ruined churches is East Anglia, counties of Norfolk and Suffolk. Uh, and there's an especially good church which uh, um, I've been to lately and which uh, I hope to return to many times. It's called Cove Highs and it's almost on the flat beach here between Lowestoft and Southwold, not very far uh, up the coast from Aldborough. And it's a very large church, uh, a total skeleton, I mean, no, no windows left, no roofs left. And it rears itself in a magnificent manner up into the air high above you. And there is an example of one of these things which I almost like best at the moment for painting. It's like a ship with a funnel, isn't it? A sea or something, a tower. It just seems to be, if you don't see the, the funnel, you don't see the ship. And the, the modern ships that don't have funnels. <laughs> I think the same in churches, rather, that you know, it's what sort of shows it's a church. My father was a Westminster solicitor whose office was just around the corner from the Tate Gallery. And I used to be dumped there sometimes by my mother, who shopped in the Army Navy stores until five o'clock. And my father would pick me up and take me home. And so I knew the Tate very well from early age and loved it. I had a rather nice drawing master at my public school, which was Epsom. We only had one day a week anyway. And uh, I did win the drawing prize there, but I didn't win any other prize, I may say, ever. I went into the law as a solicitor. I was trained up to the final, in which I failed. Not notoriously, but by, you know, margin. At which point my father died, and my mother thought I was getting to look a bit thin and wan and neurotic, so she paid for me to go to an art school, really. That's what it amounted to. I'd just been doing a vaguely outline, a vague outline of the uh, whole composition. And I thought I'd, uh, you know, just begin to indicate some color in case it all changed, because the light as it is is rather beautiful. Um, that's, uh, it's a good idea to sort of, when, it seems to me, when the uh, uh, light is as good as it is, it's try, one gets a quick, registration of what you've got. You can always abandon that and do another one afterwards with more elaborate statements about the details that you have left out in the first one. At the time when John Piper was at art college in the early 20s, painting in England seemed to have lost its way. The excitement the new century had promised, which painters like Wyndham Lewis had celebrated, ended for many English artists with the experience of the First World War. And even to attempt to paint English subjects was called into question by art critics who advocated French subject matter over English. Roger Fry was the most influential to hold this view. I despised a lot of his criticism. 
I think I had a very critical, early critical opinion of Roger Fry. So I thought he was too overcritical of British painting of all times, going back, way back to Turner and Cotman, Bonington and so on. Um, and over elaborately keen to publicize the modern French painting, which I think we the students, the students all admired, but uh, you know, we thought it might go a bit far, some of us. We all thought that uh, there was quite a lot to be said for English painting, which was centered upon quite different things, except that uh, I and my most cherished friends thought that the French painting of the contemporary movement was worth exploring too. And that's what I proceeded to do, really, over several following years, a good many following years. But it didn't stop us, I think, from sitting down and painting English subjects and trying to see what we could in the English landscape. Despite his love for the English landscape, Piper's early works were abstract constructions. I don't know how they arrived quite, except that again, that they, they were due to these visits to Paris where I'd seen such things happening. One couldn't avoid them really because the, the, the constructivist movement was in full blast, you know, out there. And I thought it was very interesting. I thought it was the nearest uh, thing one could possibly get to sculpture, sculpture if one was a born painter, really, you know, or, or somebody who wasn't really uh, looking at sculpture with any sort of acquisitive interest. Uh, but here were things which you could relate to a canvas with wires and rods and, and other objects, and you could cut them out yourself. And I did a lot of this sort of um, pierced tin and things which you bought in what's within the equivalent of DIY shops. From abstract constructions, Piper moved to abstract paintings, which depended on certain disciplines. It consisted of, of things like using only perpendiculars and horizontals and half circles and anything that happened to suit me for the time being, but I very often kept on for quite a long time with this kind of thing. And on the whole, I didn't deviate much from, from these rules during that period. I did this, really, because I thought it was an admirable and useful and probably, for me, necessary uh, discipline in order simply to learn what happened if you put a simple colour against a simple other colour, say a blue against a red or a grey against a, a brown, just to see the reactions of the colours and to see whether they were interesting or exciting or they were better than other colours. These two little paintings, which were called Some Forms Moving, I think is the title I gave it, was a different type of organized discipline, whereby one used the same forms identically, as far as I could make them so, but moved them about in different places of the picture. What do you think about that period when you were painting abstract paintings? What's your residual opinion of it? I, I look back on it as I felt it was at the time. It was a useful uh, exercise for me myself uh, and it was influenced by what was going on in France but only again in retrospect really uh, though it was as far as I was concerned because I did go to France and watch it happening but it was really like going for a nice long walk in the fresh air and seeing trying to clear the clear your mind uh, of what uh, uh, prejudices it already had and to see if one could start really painting with a certain amount of knowledge, which you could build up uh, more by uh, watching what happened to colors uh, um, neighboring each other in a, in a picture. Uh, but it was really a, a totally personal exercise. And all this I idea of group movements and this sort of stuff is really pretty good nonsense. Did you do that at the expense of everything else? I mean, did you do that solely? Did you feel, oh, well, I'm not going to paint English subjects for the Not moment? at all. No, not at all. I went on exploring English churches all the time, and going around on a bike part of the time, and if not on a bike, we were in a car, in an old Morris Gallery, when there was any petrol. But after this abstract um, span, you made a fairly emphatic public return to representational painting. Yes, I did. 
It was fairly emphatic. It spread over a decent time, and it was uh, decent. And it sounds like a funeral <laughs> of abstraction. But it was, in a way. But uh, it was also, uh, you might say, smoothed out by the collages which I was doing all through the abstract period, which were taking around the country a portfolio with bits of scraps of paper, which I just fancied the colour of, and thinking that they looked like something in nature, but I wasn't quite sure what. And then sitting down solemnly on my behind on a perhaps on a Macintosh, and with a sketch uh, sketchbook or a board in front, and just sticking these pieces of paper on and looking up and seeing if they didn't look like you know vaguely in the shape of things that were there, like a an Irish tower or something in an old ruin or a, a wide landscape with some trees. But all this was my sort of concession to naturalism <laughs> while I was being a total abstractionist. Piper's affection for English architecture led him in 1937 to contribute to the famous series of shell guides. These broke new ground by illustrating the English countryside in unconventional detail. They drew the reader's eye to things he might otherwise have missed. Piper's collaborator on several of these guides was the poet John Betjeman. It's interesting, I think I haven't thought of some time, but Paul Nash was quite a friend at that time of mine. And he got very cross when I became a really quite a close friend of John Betjeman's. And he said, the trouble with you two, you always giggle everything out of, uh, out of court or something. And I said, but Paul, uh, humor's very important in life. Why do you laugh yourself sometimes? And he said, well, but you should be serious about painting. It's a very serious matter. John is certainly, uh, you know, trivially serious about something. I said, well, Paul, John basically is a very important and serious poet, in my view. And he said, well, he may be, but there's no reason you know he should. And that, that's rather symptomatic. And I felt guilty about it for a little time. Thought well, perhaps he was right. I wasn't really a serious person at all. But John and I certainly had a marvelous laugh, the funniest laugh that I've ever had in that period. And I wouldn't have sold them for anything if I said, well, you. You can either laugh or you can be a painter. I've chosen the first, you know. They're all to think of, isn't it? Piper's photographs for the shell guides found beauty in the unexpected. His enjoyment in exploring England in detail and from unusual viewpoints is the subject of a new book by Richard Ingram. This is a typical um, shell guide view of a church at that time when the guides first came out. Things like tombstones and monuments, or even uh, Norman fonts and that sort of thing, were things that were generally despised. Uh, Georgian churches, certainly, and things like um, uh, nonconformist chapels in Wales. These were all things that uh, Betjeman and Piper, as it were, sort of rescued from oblivion. And now, I suppose, we take all that sort of thing for granted. Was there a sense in which it was a democratization of the way you looked at landscape, that you looked at a row of terraced houses as well as a stately home, that you looked at a, a village pump as well as a 13th century uh, church and so on. I think they couldn't say anything nearer my heart. That's absolutely what it was. Yes, I can hardly add to it, to that as a, as a description of what we were trying to do and see. I mean, we saw um, non-conformist chapels for the first time, really. And um, people uh, really, again, thought that was frightfully funny. Why are these people photographing or sketching these churches? And John Betjeman and I, wrote, we wrote a long, he wrote a long, long article, which I illustrated, with drawings and photographs in the Architectural Review. Everybody thought we were being just balmy, you know. We were just observing things in the ordinary way. And really loving them, saying that's a better one than that. And, oh, look, there's a winner. 
Uh, but it was that attitude that Shell, that, that Shell guides took, and they were willing to notice anything. I remember a photograph I took of Schweppes' ginger ale um, at a place called Salford in Oxfordshire, uh, players' cigarettes, and then tea, tea for those that wanted something. It was plastered all round like a signpost. And John wrote a caption on it. He called it a tree of knowledge. Well, that's the sort of joke which, you know, all Nash laughed at, and so did we, but it was made, us, made us all right. You know. John Piper and John Betchman wrote an article once called How to Like Everything, which I think is a very good description of what they were about, because in their guides, they were prepared to like um, architecture and sculpture and that sort of thing from all kinds of different periods, so that they, they found something good in the styles of every age, and they didn't mark out their period and said this is good and this is bad they 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 found all kinds of things which they liked from different periods with the approach of world war ii and the country under threat piper's romantic celebration of england and englishness took on a new and more emotional significance he received a number of government commissions to record the war in his paintings we had to produce good pictures above everything else, pictures which would stand, uh, uh, stand uh, uh, pace and character and, uh, over the years. You know, they'd have to last a bit and show really clearly, intensely what the scene was like. Um, I, whether one succeeded is not for me to say, but I mean, uh, the Coventry was a pretty moving experience and I felt moved by it and I hope that the two, three or four pictures I did of the cathedral were um, uh, uh, bombed the day after, after all, were, were uh, you know, satisfactory. In addition to painting the destruction of Coventry, Piper also wrote down his impressions. The ruined cathedral, a grey, meal-coloured stack in the foggy close, redder as one came nearer and still hot and wet from fire and water, finally presenting itself as a series of gaunt, red-grey facades stretching eastwards from the dusty but erect tower and spire. Outline of the walls against the steamy sky, a series of ragged loops, windows empty but for oddly poised fragments of tracery with spikes of blackened glass embedded in them. Inside the shell of the walls, hardly a trace of woodwork among the tumbled pile of masonry stuck with rusted iron stays. It was a very strange uh, experience because I had already done quite a number of pictures of ruined cottages. I rather liked ruins because I like the idea of uh, they, they live longer than we do, you know, and they have lived longer than we do, and here they are dying like we all must. And here you were faced suddenly with uh, instant ruin, and there was still a smell of, uh, you know, this curious wartime smell, that sort of burning funny things, sort of material and wood and stone and everything. I was very struck by that. The war left its mark on Britain's coastline, always a source of inspiration for Piper. This picture of the defences on Climping Beach in Sussex was painted in 1953. I would say that it was very much post-abstract um, and very much post-war. I mean, they both those are facts that uh, my abstract period was over and the war was over. but. It combines, to my way of thinking, a bit both of the, the, the earlier abstraction. People always thought that I'd, oh, Piper's gone all naturalistic and, you know, he's not as nearly as good as he used to be, nothing like anyway. You know. I don't think that's at all true, because I was still recalling those days when I enjoyed doing collages of beaches. I used to carry these bits of paper around in a, in a sort of made homemade portfolio 
any old coloured bits of paper, which, and I picked them out and put them on more or less arbitrarily, thinking that would do rather well with that bit over there, and then ultimately sticking them on. But this is a sort of enlargement of that process, really. The yellow and the mauvey purpley colour there, and the brick red and the bright red, all these things are derivatives from that kind of activity that they've been doing. And it also is a bit of a presage, I think, of uh, stained glass, which I've always loved. And you can see lead lines running through, or suggestions of that kind of use of black, not exactly enclosing coloured areas, but relating themselves to coloured areas, just as some stained glass does. Piper's painting of Climping Beach was bought by Sir Peter Piers and now hangs in the Alderer home which he shared with the composer Benjamin Britten. Piper designed the sets and costumes for many of Britten's stage works. His interest in designing for the stage began after seeing Diaghilev's company performing in London. I tried to be, really, in the service of what was going on. Lights have always played a part, and the thing may be absolutely in the dark half the time. You know, it may be a night scene or anything, uh, as a lot of Death in Venice is in the dark. The point of, of Black Sky, so far as I had them, was that you have a dark picture surface, irrespective of the sky or ground, all round the object you wish to exaggerate. I mean, it's a perfectly straightforward plunge into Romanticism. I remember Eric Newton, a long dead, a darling of a man who was an art critic, a well-known art critic. He said, Mr. referred to Mr. Piper's searchlights on houses, you know, talking of pictures of country houses, where I lighted them rather startlingly in sort of pale yellow with a darkness all around and all sort of things. It was, uh, of course, entirely influenced by working for the stage and thinking about the stage and remembering the Hagelhoff Ballets, really, that all that came from. And similarly, the desire to put black skies in, which was, became such a joke <laughs> around my name. You know, the King George VI thing, Mr. Pipe has been very unlucky with the weather. <laughs> and all that sort of stuff was tremendous, uh, just a straight production from working, either working for the stage or being uh, influenced by things that I'd seen and admired on the stage. Piper's association with Britain led him to be asked to design a memorial window for the parish church of St. Peter and St. Paul in Aldborough. The window is based on Britain's three church parables the Prodigal Son, Curlew River, and the Burning Fiery Furnace. I had to find a way of balancing those two panels, the left and right, because Curlew River is such an uh, obvious centerpiece. And I thought it would be a good idea overall to put the arches somehow, and then I thought that it would be rather nice to have a circular head to the old man's porch, where he's greeting his son, son returning, with a little little um, tiled roof over the top of it, and balancing that with a pottery kiln, which was quite a bright idea. I was doing a lot of ceramics at that time, and I thought, <laughs> that, that is like an old Burslem or Stoke-on-Trent pottery kiln, you know, that shape that they have at the top. And then again, I thought of the balance business, and I thought, well, flames, flames, smoky flames coming out of the top balanced by ivy or creepers or whatever coming down from above to balance that. That's how they're, they're designed. These flat, almost featureless beaches are the kind of coastline Piper has enjoyed all his life. Well, there are three main uh, main things, aren't there, that all unite and change and uh, so on, but they're really the sky and the beach, which um, it's difficult to distinguish with, which is the lighter of the two, really. 
and then there's the sea which is certainly much darker and of course constantly changing and we all know that all those bits can can change indefinitely and constantly as you like um, but uh, they're, they're, they remain themselves each time and it's, it's, it's that sort of basic uh, stability, I think, of the the uh, beach, the beach, the sea, and the sky that that, that one loves about it, and it's simplified to the extent of it being the the view being about nothing else. I think that's what I like about it. Really. At least half of me is an abstract painter always, and. Uh, I had a long period of being a totally abstract painter in the 30s. Um, and I used to do things at that time by sort of erecting artificial um, uprights on what I imagined to be a beach looking on the sea. I love the sea. I always did love the sea. It's a sort of old mother fixation or something, you know, which we, most of us have. Um, and these erect objects became um, uh, different shapes and they became just symbolic screens against the sea. I first enjoyed doing it enormously at Dungeness, where, where uh, in the old days there were no um, atomic power stations there, and I wish there were two fairly large ones. And there was a very prominent and delightful lighthouse with um, red and white stripes. The French painter Braque was an early source of inspiration for Piper's paintings of beaches. He did an enormous number of pictures of beaches with boats on, without boats on. Um, and I was very much influenced by those. He really saw a beach in quite a new light, um, simply by singling out the size of pebbles and doing big ones, and then simplifying boats very much in relation to them and making, giving everything the same kind of human characteristic, if you know what I mean. And I was very much influenced by those. I always try to see colour in, uh, as of the same importance and in the same manner as form. You know, it's an impossible thing to do. But I don't... Um, I, I think colour's a thing... You can invent both, of course. I was say, I think colour's a thing you, you can invent with impunity. Because people will believe anything, or you believe anything yourself. You can convince yourself that you see any colour in anything. You, you know, your, you, whoever you're with, somebody says, my word, that's pink, isn't it? Bright pink, about something perfect ordinary, like a white handkerchief or something, because it's catching some light from somewhere. And you say, oh yes, so it is, and it looks just like the green behind it. We all can all do that. And I think it's very important that you should, but I think you should do the same with form, that you should be able to see, um, I don't know, cat's eyes or, or pillar boxes or anything in something which reminds you of it and take, uh, take that and just use it as an element in your, in your painting. That you say to yourself, well, supposing I put some yellow there, would it um, add or subtract from, from the totality? And if you think it adds, then you try something else as well, you know, and you can build up a whole painting in that moment. Irrespective of actual appearances at that moment, I think. I know that's rather immoral from many point, people's points of view, but it's so much the better for me. During the course of his career, Piper's not only been a painter, as well as working in the theatre, he's designed tapestries, fabrics and ceramics. But throughout his life, he's been drawn to churches, either painting them or designing stained glass windows. I remember being taken, I think it was probably to Chartres, on a sort of foreign tour with my father. And I was not all of a heat by it. I thought it was wonderful, this, this uh, daylight coming through this immensely intense uh, colour, you know. One really marvellous quality that stained glass has is it, the, the intensity of colour that, uh, that, that one gets. If you paint on paper or, or on canvas, you, uh, you, uh, you get some of the paper reflecting through water, if it's watercolour. But of course, if you're, if you're painting in oil, you simply get reflected light or reflected colour. With stained glass, you have the colour 
in, in the very nature of the glass, the thickness of the glass, and the intensity is double, treble, anything you like. And I've tr tried many times to copy stained glass because I thought it would be good for its effect on my own painting. And uh, you never can achieve anything like the intensity, of course, in, on paper or canvas. Piper has sketched and painted old and ruined churches for many years, and it's what he's concentrating on at the moment. They combine his love of church architecture and his strong feelings about buildings in decay. The thing I'd like to do, really, with these, um, with the early stages of these drawings, is keep everything fluid so that you don't have to have committed yourself to the final statement of any final kind, you know. And uh, the art of that is really not making any positive statements at all. I will lead you astray later. this first stage of a painting, Piper still prefers to do a sketch rather than take a photograph. The um, camera's too positive about it all, you know. It gives you the, in, uh, the instant information. It doesn't give you any of the, the relationship of uh, details to holes and, uh, you know, the, the impression that you get in, a, in, a, in a, a slightly longer period of overall light. The camera takes just what's happening at that moment, you know. And uh, this takes as long as, well, as long as it takes to draw, you know. It was much more beautiful when I started, and I uh, should try and keep that. You see, the sky was much more like that, actually. It's very really ag agitated. 
Well, the camera would probably just have done that, but it wouldn't have um, done what happened afterwards as well and added, added them all up into a hole. see that I've done quite a lot of things which I would like to do again differently. Oddly enough, the, the tower come, comes out much better and it's much more like the texture of the whole, that I would like to have the whole thing, things like that. You know, there are whole differences in, in the... That uh, watercolour I did on the spot in front of the camera at Kofeith and I did that one from it when I came home with reference to one or two uh, other sketches that I'd done which uh, I I illuminated this area here which is the part I think that makes that subject it's, it's that wonderful airiness of the, of the ruin against, uh, against the sky and uh, I went back the next day after we'd finished this one and did that drawing. When I got these home and uh, began to look at them, I decided that that was really much more like what I really saw in Copenhagen Church than that was. That that's a little bit over-dramatised, which sometimes one does do when uh, confronted by a new and exciting subject. And uh, then a, a week or two later, I got a canvas, a rather big canvas, and did that from it. There are things like the, this that I think need defining a bit, and uh, that's why I was beginning with this, with this sky affair, try and liven things up a little bit, and uh, uh, so that when that's livened up too, it won't sort of jump too much, you know? Uh, um, stone and uh, flint. These, th th those are flints, the black of, of flints, what are called nap flints, that's given a sharp front edge of, of making them look very black. And stone against them are very much a feature of the, these churches, and I think they need bringing out. This decoration became quite a feature in the 14th, 15th century. Yes, flint and stone, very pretty it is, I think. If you look at an old building which is weathered very, very long and um, slow, very long and slowly, it grows all sorts of funny excrescences of mosses and lichens and things, and you know, bits of stone get revealed and um, that weren't r revealed originally, and all the paint goes and the woodwork goes grey, and it's, it just seems to me that that is a possible way of representing this, these things in. The, I'm very often accused of a kind of nostalgia and lacking the decay for its own sake. Well, I do like decay, what I always like to call pleasing decay, you know, there's such a thing.
you can see anything, anything you jolly well like, really. And that's what painting's all about, I think. I mean, you've had uh, a proper painter does see these colors and uh, makes a combination of them, which, uh, with any luck, and there is a great deal of luck in it, you know, it comes out like nature. But it also comes out, um, if you like, better than nature, different from nature. There's no point in being uh, naturalistic about it, trying to represent exactly what, what is there. What you want to make is a coherent whole like nature's made. That's what I think painting is. There's not a great deal more. I'd, uh, I'd, uh, normally, I'd probably take a quite long look at this stage. How do you react to the um, criticism sometimes expressed that your works are nostalgic and nostalgic used in a, I suppose, rather belittling way? How do you respond to that? Well, I, I don't respond to it really very much. I, uh, <laughs> it doesn't worry me, frankly, because I think nostalgia, like anything else, can be intense or, or uh, trivial. Um, and if if it is nostalgia that I'm interested, you know, that gets me, as it were, I think it's pretty intense, and therefore we're okay because anything that's intense is good enough for me. I don't mind. Experience is all uh, is is not all intense, but if it is intense, it's worth having. I think, and nostalgia is only another form. If it's nostalgia for something, which I suppose in my case it's supposed to be old ruins or something. Uh, well, then it means love, because, uh, and you have to do a lot of working out and thinking about uh, about that. I mean, uh, the, 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 again, the wallflowers that grow on the buildings and th that are all pulled off by the Ministry of Works, they have, don't, they don't just have nostalgia, they, have, they just want us to have preserved ruins, which are just like that, because they are so beautiful. They're like the old guidebook writers, who just thought it didn't matter what a building looked like, it was whether it was old or not that mattered. Well, I don't think that, and I think that I, I mind whether it's old or not, and if it's old, I have nostalgia for it. That's what I like about Suffolk, those trees. It'd be nice on the skyline. It'd be nice to have them in, in a view somewhere. I have very often gone against trends, trends and tides when I thought it was right, for me. I've only thought of what uh, uh, it's a sort of self-admiring view again, you know. I always pursued what I thought was right for me, and it's a sort of bloody-mindedness that I have, which just makes me not take any notice of that sort of thing. I put up with an immense amount of awful criticism in my time. So have most English artists, for goodness sake, in my generation and before. But I really think sometimes I've had, had more than was my share. And I really got so used to uh, rude remarks from people talking about searchlights played on buildings and all that sort of thing, and black skies forever and all that, you know, skies blacker than ever <laughs> or whatever it is, uh, that uh, I, I don't notice either one way or the other. I just think that it's, um, well, that's associated with me, well, fine, but it's not what I'm really about. And so I go on quite happily. And when I say quite happily, I really have got to the stage where I am quite happy about it. I don't give a hoot whether the, whether people like my work or not. I sometimes like them better if they do. I get quite fond of them, <laughs> but otherwise I don't. I pursued what I wanted to pursue. And it's my only merit, I think, too. You've only got to look properly at anything, really, to uh, see something in it, I think. 
almost, anyway. And you see, this is rather beautiful, surely, the way the river winds and a few objects on that nice bank up there. Oh, beautiful. I'd like to, if I left a legacy, I would like to leave just a reminder of the beauty of the English landscape.